Thank you, Benjamin. Um, yes, I'm uh, quite excited today uh, to uh, dive into this conversation with Bani. Uh, the talk, as you know, is titled Aspirations and Failure in the Everyday. And you, if you tuned in at six, you probably, or a little later, you might have just seen uh, Bani's work, An Unforeseen Situation, right before this, uh, which gives you a little bit of reference, if you're not already familiar with the work, uh, into uh, Bani's uh, practice. And also, the film is going to be available uh, for online viewing um, until tonight, so if you missed it, there's still a chance to catch that. Uh, I'm briefly going to um, introduce Bani. Uh, and uh, so Bani is, a, is an artist based in um, Berlin and, Park, uh, and Karachi, between the two cities. Uh, and uh, she uses video and photography to comment on politics and culture, often through humorous and absurd vignettes. Uh, she studied visual arts at the National College of Arts, uh, Lahore, and then she uh, did her MFA from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Uh, her work has been exhibited uh, worldwide um, in solo and group shows, and the uh, list is too long <laughs> to repeat right now, but what I am going to mention is uh, her major survey show that took place in 2019 uh, at Gropius Bau Berlin, uh, which also traveled to uh, Sharjah Art Foundation, and now it will be uh, reaching its final uh, destin the third and final destination in at MCA Chicago later this year. Um, so welcome Bani and thank you. thank you for your time and um, so I was just thinking if we could uh, just to give everyone a little bit of background and about um, uh, the formative years of your training as an artist and then uh, start beginning to practice and I'm just thinking about this time when uh, you went to uh, NCA, um, which is uh, post uh, military dictatorship of uh, Zia ul Haq. Um, and uh, it is uh, just like the first uh, democratic government, the return of the democratic government has happened, and it's the first female prime minister of the country. Uh, couldn't have been a better comeback. Uh, but um, so most of your professors were people who had been. Um, like it, it was an art school, so there are, most of them are were anti-establishment, and uh, a lot of them were also um, key members of the women's movement. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, some of the artists were also those who signed the, who drafted the Women Artists Manifesto as well. Mm -hmm. So I'm just thinking, like uh, you were. Uh, like those were your first impressions in a way and these were the people teaching you um, and then after graduation you um, came back to return to Karachi which is your home and uh, you forged new alliances with um, with um, artists from different art, art schools like especially in this valley school of art and architecture uh, which had recently formed and at the time, uh, it was like there was also the Karachi pop movement that mm -hmm. was taking place. So, if you could talk a little bit, like walk us through uh, these influences and how they play a role in your trajectory as an artist. Um, thank you, first of all. This is very ex exciting to be here. I haven't been to this space before. Um, uh, thank you, Haja. Um, so yeah, the NCA is, uh, the National College of Arts to begin with is in Lahore, I'm from Karachi and I think that uh, it is very, um, it was a very formative period for me that, that time because it's a national university, um, so it's unlike um, the art colleges in Karachi which are private universities, this is a national university, it is the biggest art school in Pakistan where there are people from all across the country in its basic ethos as being a, not a private university but a public university it was very uh, it's very particular and to this day it is is not interchangeable with other universities in that way and um, and I think it was um, it's an interesting thing like I think and maybe it applies to all forms of college and education a lot of our experiences that it isn't necessarily exactly the manner in which we were taught or what we were taught mm -hmm but the politics and the lives of people who are um, tutors and teachers 
Uh, Lala Ruch was a, a teacher of mine, um, and she is, um, I think now in Germany also, after her work with Shonen Documenta, a lot of people know her. Mm -hmm. um, and Salima Hashmi, um, Kudus Mirza, uh, Nazir Shataullah. Um, I mean, a lot of who were, um, yeah, like we said, it was an art university. It was confronted with the Punjab University, which had a lot of right-wing religious groups uh, that were operating in it. But also because of being a national art university, the politics of the outside entered um, the the college space, mm -hmm. and so it was kind of my first ex my first exposure to Pakistani politics, mm -hmm. and uh, and that was actually. Benazir getting sworn in was my memory of, I think I was, when was it, 1991 uh, or, I don't, I don't forget the year, but yeah. that memory. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I think more than um, being part of a, w the wim a women's movement or any particular political um, intentions or uh, groups, it was more the lifestyles and choices of people individual faculty members who were all very politicized. Mm -hmm. uh, that was very influential for me. Um, and then contra in contrast to that, um, and this is a lot of people dealt with the questions of dictatorship, uh, right. uh, what had happened. And um, so it was also my first political awakening and getting a language uh, with which to talk about these things, inheriting it. Um, and then coming back to Pak Karachi, which was a very important moment is I graduated and I came back to Karachi and the Indus Valley School of Art and Architecture had just been set up. And one of the most um, sort of meaningful and, and seminal moments in Pakistani art history was happening around that time where um, the, the f a group of faculty members who had all just returned also from different parts of the world where they had finished their studies mm -hmm. were teaching there. And this is David Aylesworth, Durya Kazi, Iftikhar Dadi, Elizabeth Dadi. And uh, they, their work was primarily starting to look at, um, at, the, uh, at the language, the visual language of urban culture and the street. And this is a very simple, in very simple way to put it. Um, but basically it kind of drew, for me, what is a kind of uh, drew everyone out of their late modernist practices of studio-based art making, mm -hmm. pulled them out and we were all kind of, um, uh, made to witness and examine mm -hmm. what was happening on the street. And mm -hmm. that um, translated into very different trajectories for all of us um, at the end of the day. Yeah, yeah. and yeah, and uh, that's, uh, yeah, wha such a fascinating time. And like, I think it has been formative for the later generations who came after you guys. Uh, it's played yeah. quite an important role. Um, so I'm going to uh, touch a bit upon uh, the work that we've uh, like uh, shown today, uh, an unforeseen situation. And um, I'm just thinking about like your, your work, which is often, you know, like triggered by conversations or newspaper clippings, especially like uh, this one. Um, maybe you could uh, speak a little bit about that, but also like, uh, I'm just thinking like, it's, it's almost as if you scavenge absurdity. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm just thinking like, uh, can you share with us like how, like what is it that attracts you uh, to it and, and how you work with that? I mean, I think that for everyone who lives in South Asia has, is a South Asian, uh, there's different forms of absurdity that play out every day, whether it's the, uh, you know, the difficulties of, uh, of a life in a domestic situation of water and the uh, logistics of life in an urban environment in Pakistan and what plays out. The class dynamics, gender, dy gender dynamics, things are generally a bit unarticulated and, um, and all over the place and very funny uh, or, or odd, uh, realities play out. Um, the newspaper is an interesting thing for me and I've really now only started thinking about it and I think um, the newspaper is a place where there are headlines or stories that are reported that are of uh, common interest. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so there, just that determines that I'm interested in the popular story. Mm -hmm. So the popular story enters my imagination and then I like to dismantle it in some way or the other. Mm -hmm. So um, for instance, one of my earlier videos is uh, called Reserved and it's about a VIP that's arrived in, um, in the city, it's Karachi, 
and everyone's life has been put on hold. And I fictionalized it, I shot the whole thing, and um, it's a very simple thing, but I'd say, so there are certain things like in Pakistani culture, you have the concept of VIP movement. Mm -hmm. Now there's nothing, absolutely nothing that is natural or predetermined about that. There's nothing, there's the, it is something very strange. The fact that we've accepted the idea that there is a person amongst all of us who is a very important person. So of course those terms really trigger me and uh, excite me because you immediately want to get hold of them and tear them apart. And so then I make a film that is about uh, an arrival of a VIP and what does it mean. In a similar way, the video that um, we, we, uh, you've shown today, an unforeseen situation, uh, newspaper, a photograph, which I display when I show the video in the, in a mu in the museums, um, and, and it says it says that the event where uh, no world record breaking event cancelled where apparently in Punjab um, in Lahore somewhere thousands of people were invited to come and sing the national anthem, but people didn't show up because there was a terrorist threat and no one came. Now the people who are presenting that story have no sense of irony about that. Why should we all be singing the national anthem? Why should we all be breaking the na uh, record? So these things obviously are not, people just accept it at face value. Yeah. So that's where there's so much of the stuff on face value, like, you know, the kind of, on the third page of the newspaper, you find these really interesting yeah. titles. Yeah. And they just accept it for what they are. And I think that it kind of is a kind, uh, an accepted uh, set of, concerns or values um, that is assumed that we, we are all in agreement about them. But they are p completely absurd. Um, and it's nice to pick them, pick them up. And I also think I have to say that I think the newspaper and internet, for various reasons, I think we'll discuss that later, has also become a portal with which I exist in the country. Even when I'm in Karachi, it's through the newspaper that you exist and engage with a larger reality compared to, I don't know, whether we can talk about the fact whether it's because of my gender or how comfortable I feel being a, involved in the city myself, but yeah. Yeah, 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 uh, yeah that's, and, and uh, this is also just, uh, sorry, <laughs> I forget the mic. Um, yeah, this is all, I, I'm thinking about, you know, like um, the nar narratives and in, in, like narrative is a very important part of your work. But these are snippets of narratives. Like these are not like these are captured moments. Like it's just, uh, and I'm just thinking about um, how your experiences and your practice is shaped by visceral experiences, right? And uh, and, and and I'm just uh, thinking like what because often like uh, I should not generalize, but but. Uh, in telling a story, a lot of times the idea is to perhaps give more of a background uh, or mm. something. So I'm just thinking like uh, your reason for working in this manner and, and of, you know, um, yeah, creating, cr creating narratives in this manner. Mm. I think that it's also, A, I don't have a training at all. So I went to National College of Arts, I was a painter. I went to the School of the Inst Art Institute, I was a painter and I did installation um, and all of that. So I never really had to struggle with having learned filmmaking, where I think there's a lot of, you inherit the history of filmmaking mm -hmm. and then you're kind of uh, grappling with that and where you fit in. Mm -hmm. I became, I started working with video after doing what I did and I think that there's a comfort with, um, there's a comfort with um, a story that is just, uh, or, or the lack of a story, but just a moment that plays out. So uh, there's no compulsion to tell a story. I don't feel obliged to do it, but I think also it's consciously, because it is, uh, it, uh, it's an abstraction. So if you have, if you, when I pull out a moment where it is about a moment where a city is waiting for somebody to arrive, somebody who is obstructing their day-to-day -day their day-to-day -day movement and um, schedule, um, I think that's, an, that's a little, there's an abstraction in that. Now we don't know what happens, we don't know who the person is, we don't know where they're going, we don't know what will happen to the people who are waiting, it is just about waiting. Yeah. So I think that it's, some of it comes from the idea that I'm, I have, my training is in making a singular moment 
in, in terms of an installation or, um, or photographs or whatever. Mm. So I'm comfortable with nothing much happening, except yeah. that that nothing much happening plays out over 10 minutes in my work. Um, so that's, yeah, so I'm really comfortable with yeah. the non-narrative. Yeah. Although it's very narrative, my work, yeah. but the non-conclusivity of my narratives. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and with that, I'm, I'm just going to mention, like, I think it's very important because um, with this, like, you know, like, no compulsion of, of, uh, of um, sharing and telling a narrative, there is also this idea of, uh, not idea, but there's this strength in your work, and it's the translatability of it. So whether, like, I'm, for example, I'm thinking, like, even reserved or, um, or uh, for example, uh, address, mm -hmm. which was, you know, like, whether it's shown in a chai khana or in the market, or it's shown in a museum, like, it's, there, there is this quality of it that in the work that people can instantly like, you know, um, specifically from the region, like they instantly relate to it and they know what, what you're talking mm -hmm. about. So I'm just thinking like, are you like, do you have an imagined audience in mind when you're working? Like, um, how does, th like, are you thinking about who will be viewing the work? I think that it's a very abstract notion, the audience, and I think it's a, but, but abstract in the sense that it's not, um, it's basically just people who I kind of assume, I work with the assumption that uh, the people who are going to see it know what I'm talking about and they share history and they share attitudes towards humor. Mm -hmm. So there's, um, I think what one thing that is very liberating is that there's no message and I'm not trying to educate anyone, either Pakistanis about Pakistan or non-Pakistanis about Pakistan. Uh, so I think there's an assumption that we all know what we talk, what I'm talking about. So it's a shared. It's I think it's a, some form of a a shared joke. It's as if I told you an anecdote, yeah. and I know that you'd completely get it in all its details that I enjoy. So I tell it to you, and uh, you enjoy it. And so that is the w the imagined audience kind of I work with. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I think that because it's uh, because it's these abstracted moments. It's very figurative work. It's very representational in that way. It's not highly. Uh, it's not abstract in that way of not in not being able to somebody not being able to comprehend it. I think people relate to it easily. And in Pakistan, of course, it's uh, because a lot of the films are shot in Pakistan, and they're on the street, and there are characters that people identify with. I think they immediately get it. And the fact that it's contemporary art, so to speak, or that it's not a kind of a an, a story that they is uh, they used to hearing or seeing, uh, they get it and they relate to it immediately. Yeah. So there's a very quick connection. Yeah. It's identification. I think people identify. Yeah, pretty yeah and and that's a very interesting point because I'm just thinking, um, like uh, with with your show at Gropius Bao, like there was a, a really great uh, response by by the Berlin audience and they really related to the work and also were quite perceptive. So, like, can you say a few yeah, words Yeah, I think it was it? really very exciting and to, um, I was very nervous about showing in Berlin um, and it worked out really well. I think there were some decisions that were worked very well in our favor. Natasha Janwala and I, uh, Natasha, who's a curator, and I um, decided to not have too many didactic texts. So people, when they were going around the exhibition looking at where all the works, didn't feel that they had to read, which was actually worked really well because it liberated them to just uh, let the work, um, just watch the work yeah. and experience it and then go away with whatever. There was a little booklet they could take around that they mm -hmm. could read the background of, but I think a lot of people did that later yeah. about the works they engaged with. But I think what played out and the stories that played out are very simple and very, it's quite pretty simple yeah. uh, gestures, I feel. Yeah. So I think a lot of people were able to understand it. And yeah, and I was very happily, very pleasantly surprised that it wasn't like it does become when you're you know, from somewhere else, um, a, a city like Karachi or a country like Pakistan, and you uh, kind of basing uh, all your stories are based there. They're not about there, but they're based there. Yeah. It becomes about, um, is this work about Pakistan? I mean, it, it isn't, it's just about, it's about life. 
it's just, you know, the people are different skin color and the temperature is different probably. So it's, uh, it's, it was received very well and in that yeah. way. Yeah. And people were able to see the kind of um, stories or humor and things I was interested in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and this, like, this, uh, Th this is such a great point because it brings me to this, uh, like, you know, um, the fluidity in your work across borders. I, I think that's another, like, great quality. And I'm just thinking, like, because you're often, like, dismantling and ridiculing the banality of borders. And I'm just thinking, like, because there's often this idea of, you know, representative work and like uh, national representation, so I'm or identity or, or identity. Ident like yeah. So like, if you could like speak a little bit about this, you know, uh, the notion of uh, national narrative, mm. which in some places is a compulsion also, or mm. uh, happens if you know that an artist comes from a specific place. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think this is also, we were, Hajra and I were talking about this yesterday, and I think that as an, I was just thinking about national narratives, about the narratives that uh, we have been fed because we belong to nation A or nation B, um, and how it's fun to, uh, the, we should all collectively embark on an exercise where we identify all the, the narratives and beliefs that we've been fed because we belong to country A or country B, and then start ripping them apart because they are, they are just that, they are constructions and how much, of a, how much should we be believing in them. Um, and I've always been interested in the Indo-Pak border because of, of course, like all, a lot of National College of Arts kids, uh, we went to India and I just felt that it was, uh, for a lot of us who crossed the border, it is a very humbling experience because it's just the normalcy of the geography and a continuity. And a border means very little once you encounter um, the other. And and then, uh, so th and that's what a lot of my work is about is, um, and of a lot of th these experiences also get solid solidified when I lived in the US and a lot of my friends were Indians and I think that happens everywhere. And then you realize that, you know, it's all about the, with the joy of speaking the, a shared language if you're with a North Indian or eating some food together. And, yeah, come on, that's what happens. And then you live, you eat, and you joke, and you die. I mean, what the hell, what the hell does it matter where you're coming from? So those kind of ge geographic, um, geographic intimacy is so important. Mm -hmm. um, and very often I feel much closer to Indians in many different mm -hmm. ways, intellectually in many ways, than I would to Pakistani. So yeah, it's the, and now uh, living in Berlin, I just feel that I've just left so many borders. Uh, I'm not a person, I'm so comfortable at this point with being a perpetual outsider right. uh, everywhere. Even in Pakistan, I'm a complete outsider um, because there are lots of things I don't agree, subscribe to. I hold a Pakistani passport, but, mm. so I think these are, yeah, in the today's day and age, I think it's nothing. Um, and uh, yeah, and then of course my biography also is I was married to an Indian, my son is an Indian passport. Uh, there are lots of things in my, I lived in India for five years, and uh, so there's lots of things that, uh, um, kind of attest to this mm -hmm. kind of, uh, of life that I've chosen. Right. Uh, yeah. And of across the borders, yeah, because the, it is about precisely the reason why I think people are, have find it easy to access my work here as well, because it is about urban environments, right. it is about citizens versus the state. These are, you know, just basic large motifs with which um, I work. Mm. Um, yeah, anything else that I've yeah. missed about borders? No, I think I'm good. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. I'm, I'm just th thinking about, like you've been uh, talking about the importance of the ordinary and, and like you've mm -hmm. uh, spoken about it a bit. And I'm just now um, also wondering and uh, something that also came up is that like, you know, um, why fictionalize? Um, when it could be documented, because if these are the instances in everyday, yeah, yeah mm -hmm. in everyday life, then, um, you know, uh, the reason to fictionalize them. Yeah, I mean, I think that's something I think about a lot, and uh, it, it, again, because I'm not trained in documentary filmmaking or film fictional filmmaking, there was no uh, particular reason why I chose this or that, and I think there are quite a few reasons, and I think one is that I like the craft of making something, and designing and telling a story. So it's very different than surrendering to what happens outside, even though 
something that is happening in real time that you're documenting does become, um, does get your signature and your craft once you edit it. But it's something entirely different when you start putting it together as a story. So I think um, this first story film that I kind of made is this, v this VIP film. Yeah. And, um, and I think that was, uh, it was very telling. Uh, uh, I did, I screened, I scripted it, I storyboarded it. And in one moment in those 10 minutes or nine minutes, however long that film is, I was able to accumulate all waiting that I had remembered, uh, that I remember from having lived in Pakistan. Mm -hmm. So that's why a fiction became important because unlikely thing, children waiting, traffic jam, people waiting, petty bureaucracy, all of these little, little things, they all start building up and I collect them and then I accumulate them into one. So that's one reason of the fiction. Mm -hmm. And the other, I think, is to be honest, a, yeah, also that I'm c a control freak and I love these details, so I want to make sure everything is there. And documentary requires a kind of uh, collaboration um, and a surrender, mm -hmm. which maybe I'm not capable of. <laughs> and then uh, the other just is that I, I feel that as a, um, as a woman, and more, more than a woman, but also being a, sort of a middle class, upper middle class woman, my, uh, I, uh, my, my sig I signify things. And I, I have a very, it's a complex relationship with being in the city. Yeah. So I don't feel I can march in and just shoot videos of whoever I want. I'm uncomfortable, yeah. perpetually, in many ways. Um, I question that relationship between people and myself. Uh, so I feel I'm watched also, but I feel I am also embody a certain form of a power. And I can't just exercise that by walking around and, and shooting and uh, videoing whoever I want. Um, uh, yeah, but it's also, um, it's also this thing of constructing um, a particular narrative, mm -hmm. which, is, which it becomes confusing because I'm actually observing from everyday life. Mm -hmm. And I do, uh, it is just about the ordinary. So it could very well be a documentary. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah. that's why I think the fiction becomes uh, just a default uh, structure. Yeah. But also because it becomes good, and all because I'm interested in humor, hmm. and I rely not only on what I observe, but the memories of things, mm -hmm. so all the little humorous moments, I make sure that they're reenacted in, the per b uh, in a particular way. So it's kind of liberating that you accumulate little bits of memory from across cities um, in different places, and you bring them together in one work. So that's why, again, that's why fiction. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah and... Um, this just, I was just going to come to that, like this idea of like the use of humor um, to confront like, especially um, uh, to confront like uh, corrupt power structures mm -hmm. and the hierarchies. And um, you recently phrased it brilliantly and you called it the agency of laughter. Um, and I'm, I'm just like, uh, you've touched upon it briefly, but could you speak a little bit more about the humorous and satirical uh, tonality of your work and, and how, you know, how it aids your intentions and the stories that you want to tell, like the moments that you've picked up? Yeah, I mean, I think also, I think Pakistanis are pretty funny. They're uh, very sardonic and they're satirical. And grapple with reality uh, by making fun of situations. I think that's a very, that's a tendency that we are very common, we, we uh, are very familiar with. Um, but yeah, I think it is very disabling and it's not a lot of people, and also the art world is incredibly serious, takes itself very seriously and they find that humor is a way of uh, making popular work that is easily accessible or whatever. And I think that yes, th that may be true, it is maybe, but that's not the intention. The intention is uh, also that humor is um, yeah, it's disabling. Whoever is being laughed at is uh, being brought down. So just laughing at somebody to bring them down is much more. Um, and I think that I always now recently I've been quoting a lot from the Orat March and how the recent manifestations of Orat March yeah. have been about uh, poking jokes and making making fun of men and their ideas about domesticity and patriarchy. And I swear, I think that on prime time shows, people were discussing, ke, why did a woman say, ke, mujhe kya pata tumhare moze ka hai? And, you know, so that the fact that it really troubled 
the, the, pa the patriarchal structures of Pakistan is very telling. Yeah. Because how dare anyone laugh at them? Whatever you want to do, you can scream and shout and cry. But, sorry. Yeah, so the, the, one of the banners that became very popular in the, in the Women's March was, how do I know where your socks are? Or, you know, so it was just such a simple, like, you know, raised eyebrow, like, dude, go, you f go to your own thing. And I think that really troubled people um, because there was kind of an assumption that women would be in, in charge of their men's wardrobe, I don't know. So, uh, so that is, uh, was really interesting to see how uh, on a national level, men were just so troubled. They were being laughed at. And actually it's really true and I think that even one of, I mean just this sort of a stance of somebody laughing, it can, it, it, it just kills you, your ego, everything. So I think, and because I'm so interested in this idea of the state and people who kind of control the lives of, and as a, I mean, as somebody like, I really feel that my, like, my people are my people and the Pakistani people or whatever, if, but the state and the Pakistani nationality means very little to me. So I'm with them. We will make love, fun of people who are trying to tell us what is right and wrong. And I think there's something, lot, uh, there's a lot to be thought about in that, uh, is, is cracking jokes at about somebody. Uh, who is oppressing you, actually, rather than bemoaning that situation. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. How are we doing with time? Can I? Yeah? Okay. Um, so, I'm just... Um... <laughs> Sorry. I could also... Th the, the other thing I wanted yeah. to talk about in terms of the border things yeah. that I wanted to mention um, was that in these days, it's also... Um, it's, it's very interesting. I was just telling Haja yesterday that the, the, with corona, I think that everyone's got the, the lots of borders uh, and it, uh, within our own cities in terms of not accessing each other and, and not being able to step out. And it makes you look at all kinds of, um, uh, all forms of state control, of course. And recently, a friend of mine in Delhi and I, Priya, and I offered a, a video course online of which Nida in which Nida participated, and it was called "In Search of New Names." And it was actually just a, a it was a way of um, a, a finding alliances and uh, working together across borders. And we really did want people from India and Pakistan and to be um, working together. So ultimately, we had about 18 participants from 12 cities across both, uh, both countries. Um, and it was that, you know, all the Zoom fatigue that everyone feels, it was, this was gone. It was just like a perfect, for me at least, instance of, uh, of how Zoom can be used brilliantly. Because we, the first day, we just um, introduced all ourselves to each other on showing our locations on Google Map, introduced our, neighbor, uh, our neighborhoods from the satellite imagery, and then showing, and then we went out for walks and got five-minute videos of our neighborhoods. So we traversed like the hills of Quetta to uh, to a tea estate in Assam, to uh, the you know Mother Island in Bombay, to Pune, to Delhi, to Lahore, to Karachi. Within two or three hours, over two days, we traveled massively. Um, a lot of people saw the intimacy of a neighborhood, of a home, of people across the border. So it was that question of like accessing each other's homes like one of the participants in Pune we walked out with her on her phone and we said hi to her mother to her father the, the you know and then another uh, girl in Quetta introduced us to her family it was the strangest and most like humanizing thing and then ultimately the project was that um, people had to partner up and make a film about each other's cities or each other's lives um, and it was so cool because I think that that, and now I'm really in in search of a, in search of an identity. I wish one could have some kind of an I I do call myself South Asian. I'm, I prefer to do that versus calling myself Pakistani. But I think it would be nice to kind of uh, because it's amazing how how uh, people believe that borders and nation states have existed forever and. Actually, it's just been the past 70 years in a lot of these places. The nation state is a big problem, as we are seeing. These days in current Middle East politics, the nation is a big problem. Yeah. Um, so it's nice to dismantle these concepts and just work across fluid geographies. Um, 
So yeah, I just wanted to mention my course. That was yeah, fun. no, it, that is so absolutely amazing. And I think like this is uh, once again, yet another like one silver lining of COVID where yeah. it has forced us uh, to make these kind of possibilities uh, like happen, to yeah. happen and, and yeah, like that is just because um, the strangest is that it's the most difficult for us. Like visas are not easy for anywhere yeah. for us, but uh, to get visas for within South Asia is the most difficult, yeah. you know? And uh, so I think like uh, this is just absolutely brilliant. And yeah. I, I really hope that they are. And it's in a more, I think, I think just uh, contact with other people and friendships mm -hmm. are a much more organic way of um, where your faith or your belief systems about the other fall apart yeah. uh, slowly yeah. and they come come apart because you get to know people yeah. and uh, yeah. yeah and that's why in India and Pakistan the the narrative machinery of like the construction of hatred and othering is is so long is such an old thing and we've been we're products of that so it is just a question of uh, how to grapple with this and do away with it just to empower ourselves, I guess. Um, yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Um, so I'm um, slightly <laughs> uh, reverting back a little bit. And I'm also just thinking, like, once again, um, th th this is a point, like, uh, you've just touched upon dialogue, and I, I'm, I'm thinking of your work again. And um, so there are, like, there is a, the idea of dialogue is also very important in your work because it's often like whether you are doing multiple channels or you are, uh, or the, the, the video is in dialogue with drawings mm -hmm. or, you know, um, or photographs. And uh, so I'm just like, can you uh, speak a little bit about, you know, the importance of dialogue in the work and how uh, you shape it? Yeah, I think it's also like a bit similar. The ex explanation would be similar to why I would do um, an abstracted moment in a in a narrative versus a closed um, narrative. I think there is the uh, the de the desire to have bits and pieces of information that which which is either within the video or as a multiple multiple channel video. Um, where you get a bit of this and you get a bit of that and a bit of that and then you pull information from that and the same goes for when I couple up um, drawing works and video mm -hmm. which are happening around the same time so that one kind of feeds the other. Yeah. Uh, because I'm, again I'm not uh, tied to traditional uh, film only or any such thing yeah. so I'm pretty Historyless, and that's the other thing we were discussing the other day is that our art history is so messy that we actually are not, we don't feel uh, uh, very tied to particular mediums and things, which I, which is very interesting when I see practices in Berlin, for instance, where there's chronology of movement, uh, a chronology of practice, mm -hmm. and where you fit in art history. I think we have very messy yeah. histories. <laughs> So we do a bit of this and a bit of that, and yeah. Yeah. which is interesting. Yeah, which is which is kind of a blessing in a way because I, I'm I'm also thinking about um, just one like the freedom to shift, but also like I'm thinking about uh, recently your foray into sound mm -hmm. um, uh, from from image um, and and like um, and I'm just like. Um, you recently mentioned um, this really interesting anecdote of this uh, phone call that you witnessed on uh, on in a bus in yes. Berlin, mm -hmm. where you could, where the person didn't know that you could understand they were yeah. speaking in Punjabi, and I'm just and you spoke about you know like the importance of sound or the song, for example, or like sounds of from different places and how you associate with that and how we uh, tune into that. So. Can you? Yeah, yeah, I mean, sound came. I did sound because when the the project just uh, to do with music and songs is called Memorial to Lost Words, and that's the first time I worked with sound. And it's basically, but it was interesting because the the intention wasn't to work with sound, but it was to 
how to work with an archive. Mm. And, uh, and I don't know how to work with archive and I don't know how to work with research. That's just not what I know how to do. So I, but I was really interested in the material and the material in this case was letters written by uh, Indian soldiers um, during World War I. Uh, people who are in hospitals, in the war fronts, in, um, in Brussels, uh, in, in Belgium, and back in the hospitals in France and England. And they're really desperate young men who are away from home. And it was their homesickness that really got to me. Because I'm also perpetually homesick. Now, whether I, I like Pakistan as a country or not, I am homesick, of course. Because I have kind of the visceral aspect of, of being in South Asia. Um, so I think that is what interested me in that in that story, and I got lots of letters written by these uh, young men, which are very of very banal details about what they're missing, and they want a flute, and they you know letters written by them that are never reached home. So there's of course that's a that's an extreme tragedy, mm -hmm. and I basically collected all the letters, and based on that I had um, I had songs composed and. Um, Ali Aftab in Lahore uh, did, sung and composed one song. And uh, Harsakya, Harsakya which are, who are the three sisters who sing in Lahore, sung the women's version. But it was basically men, songs sung by men and women, but it was letters and an archive of a moment a hundred years ago that came alive. And it was lovely to have music as mm -hmm. my art. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of people enjoyed it. Uh, it was also a very interesting moment because it was art that was in Punjabi. It was Punjabi contemporary art. That's how, that's how easily people were able to associate with it. I showed it in Lahore, in the, Lahore, uh, yeah. in the Punjab muse in Lahore Museum. Yeah. Um, and it was basically Queen Victoria's statue and it was surrounded by the speakers of Punjabi voices singing to her, yeah. saying that this, cri this war is a crime and blah, blah, blah. And a lot of people, and suddenly, you know, people, a lot of people related to that. Uh, to that. Yeah. So, of course, sound that enters, and then I did another piece, which is called Matam in Eight Different Beats, which is, um, uh, which is about and, uh, and religious rituals. Um, but it's about how songs and this sort of beat, and Matam is a, uh, is a, it's a ritual in Shiite Muslim culture, and it is about a beat, it's a body beat. Um, so it's about how these travel, and I recorded them. I recorded multiple beats and had them played. So, the, the, but the sound, I'm only just starting out with, I think, what I find, the potential mm. of sound. Mm. Um, uh, because again, it's very abstract, and, but it's highly evocative. Uh, yeah. um, so what sound, what language do you hear on the street outside? And yeah. uh, it can be pretty magical. Yeah, yeah, and I, I just like uh, was picking on your idea of homesickness yeah. and its relationship to, to sound, sound as yeah, well. Yeah. Like you know, I think. Yeah, I mean, I think the. Uh, yeah, I heard. It's also when you walk in Berlin. What you're walking in a place like Berlin, and you suddenly hear somebody speaking in Punjabi. It totally. Uh, uh, it's extremely disorienting and comforting at the same time. And I totally get away with people not knowing that I'm Pakistani. So I listen to happily listen to all conversations, eavesdrop, and I feel very happy about doing that. Yeah. Um, yeah. It was the really sweet, uh, there are a couple of, actually two bus memories that I have, which uh, are going to go into further work of mine. One was that I was sitting next to a young uh, Punjabi boy who was speaking, who had, a, uh, he, he was speaking to his father on Skype or WhatsApp. A portrait oriented phone and he's talking and his father is lying in bed in somewhere in Pakistan um, and he's could have got his head back and he's chatting um, and of course like all parents he's asking him have you learned your German have you done your visa all the really boring questions that children don't want to be asked and yes yes I'm doing that but the entire is happening on the bus and they're having this conversation between with each other, and I'm just sitting there completely immersed in this movie and this thing that's unfolding of a conversation between a father and a son. And, and I really l enjoyed the fact that we all, including myself, can be talking. And some really, an in really interesting Turkish writer has also dealt with that in a story of hers. But as 
people from elsewhere or who occupy multiple cities, especially in the age of digital connectivity, uh, we're actually in multiple places at one time. So I, this guy was in Lahore or wherever at the same time as being in M41 bus in Berlin. Uh, and then he was headed somewhere. So this reality, the day is actually full of multiple geographies at the same time because we are visually, and I can be talking to my mother and I can hear the crows, which were very loud in Pakistan, and I can hear the crows, so, but the crows are kind of informing my experience of walking on a street in Berlin. So it's all pretty magical. Um, what that potential is and where, and what does sound do to transport us away into other places. Yeah, and there was another anecdote. The other the anecdote issue. is a, a, a Kurdish man, and this is late at night, uh, when we could still go out to parties, I was going out to a party. Those were the <laughs> days. <laughs> but, uh, and I, it's dark and there's only three or four people in the bus and there's this man sitting on, uh, on one of the seats and he just started singing full-throatedly a song. And it, was, it filled the bus completely and it was such a magical moment. He didn't care, he had a beautiful voice, but because he assessed the situation, he was alone, he was singing to himself, his eyes were closed. He was in a trance of just singing. And because there was, he wasn't disturbing anyone because it was kind of an off time. Um, and I was amazed that he was, by singing to himself, he was able to create um, a, a cloud of sound around him which transported him somewhere else. So I think this thing of how we music and language conversations um, and how they ground us in places where a lot of that is gone, it makes it very possible and maybe it's an ideal life where there's sound from elsewhere and the geography of somewhere else, I don't know. It's a very uh, interesting combination of uh, things that feed us on a day-to-day -day level. Yeah, yeah. No, that's, that's a really beautiful idea, how sound and uh, how music and language spe especially is so location, grounded into yeah. location and how it transports us. Um, I'm going to halt my questions here and uh, open it up for... Um, the, if if uh, anyone has any questions or uh, if any of our friends are watching this online, if uh, anyone has any questions for Bani. Well, I think I need to find musicians and sing, and uh, uh, yeah, I, I need to, there are lots of people where there's the idea of singing to oneself. So it has to be, it's fictionalized, it would be scripted, it would be a cinematic representation of, of characters and languages and uh, the urban landscape. But it's also, it also came, I was very inspired to do it at a time when the streets of, I would go out for late walks during lockdown uh, late at night and Berlin was never, it was completely different. So it was kind of, it is just an ongoing thing about how do you populate uh, the streets of Berlin, which are empty with bodies and people from somewhere else. So I'm still figuring it out, but it would be hired singers and actors who would sing to themselves or I don't know whether, how I bring in all these aspects of language and, uh, and, but I would just like to, I forget the name of the Turkish writer who talks about this multiplicity, I for, and this is embarrassing because I'm quoting her, her story, but it's basically this beautiful moment in her, it's called Spiegel im Hof, or Hof im Spiegel, either one, but it's about the, uh, the courtyard this, uh, that this woman is in this woman's mm -hmm. building, and she has a mirror in her apartment and from the mirror she can see the neighbors, it's reflected. And she's having a conversation with her mother in Istanbul. And she's telling her mother in Istanbul what is happening in, uh, in the mirror, in the hof, in her, in her building. And so there's this three-way conversation happening. So I'm interested if how these Skype conversations or WhatsApp conversations on video that we have, how can they enter a film that is in Berlin? And how can multiple realities? So I don't know. There's so many ways I could do it. I haven't really made my child. I've been homeschooling my child for a year. I haven't made any art. So now, now I'll start. <laughs> Maybe think of the Hitchcock movie, 
yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, of course. I think it is, I think reality, like I said, like these anecdotes or these two instances that I tell you of, of they are reality. And so it's pretty magical. What you see in real life is much, is really magical. So it would be very much that. But of course it would be more constructed in the sense that there's empty spaces and things like that, which is more artificial. Okay. Good. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, Bani. Thank this was you. so nice. Uh, and thanks again, Benjamin yeah, and Anna. And, and I yeah, hope people enjoyed it. This was it. so lovely. And uh, thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Thank you.